For the first time ever, City of Dust, The Evolution of Burning Man explores the story of how the legendary Nevada Gathering evolved from humble countercultural roots on San Francisco's Baker Beach into the world-famous desert convergence it is today. Using historical archives, we can trace the civic growth and development of Burning Man's temporary city that arises annually in Nevada's Black Rock Desert. Burning Man's recent transition to a nonprofit organization also reveals how it has become a global cultural movement with a future beyond its ancestral desert home. The origins of Burning Man cannot be considered without acknowledging California's social, political, and cultural fabric of the 1980s. The height of the hippie subculture long past, the time was ripe for a new alternative social movement to satisfy the desires of those who wish to pursue experiences beyond mainstream society. In the San Francisco Bay Area, this countercultural trend manifested itself in two related groups, the Suicide Club and the Cacophony Society. The Suicide Club, organized in 1977, encouraged adult play, urban exploration, and challenging one's fears. A decade later, this subculture evolved into the core membership of the Cacophony Society. Artists, performers, outsiders, and nonconformists joined the ranks of Cacophony. Anyone could be a member. Cacophonists championed a spirit of collaborative play, good-spirited pranks, and costume gatherings. Through group outings, known as zone trips, organizers encouraged subversive engagement with mainstream society. It is against this cultural backdrop that the first Burning Man gatherings took place. Baker Beach is a public beach located just south of San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge. Baker Beach had been a gathering place for decades, attracting artists like Mary Grauberger, who had been organizing annual summer solstice gatherings on Baker Beach since the 1970s. One day in 1986, Larry Harvey phoned his friend Jerry James and proposed they build a man and burn him on the beach. Later that day, when Larry and a handful of friends burned an eight-foot wooden effigy of a man on San Francisco's Baker Beach, their bonfire beach party catalyzed what would eventually become known as Burning Man. Neither Larry nor Jerry remembers precisely when they made the decision to return to Baker Beach, but they did so for the next four years. Each year, another wooden figure, crudely built from scrap lumber, was constructed, and friends gathered to help transport and erect the sculpture on the beach. Flyers and posters were designed to spread the word about the gatherings. Crowds on the beach swelled, the assemblies became an annual ritual, and a community was created. The Bohemians have a kind of erotic sense of property, Larry Harvey has said of these early gatherings. We didn't worry about getting a venue or asking permission. We were guerrilla. We were illegal, going down to the beach to burn this thing, and we depended on our own communal efforts undertaken together. Everything changed, however, when the police put an end to the beach burns due to increased risks of public safety and a lack of a permit. While participants were allowed to erect the now 40-foot-tall man sculpture on Baker Beach one last time in 1990, they were not authorized to burn it. Nevada's Black Rock Desert, approximately six hours east of San Francisco, would become the new destination. Located in the northwestern Great Basin, the Black Rock Desert boasts a 400-square-mile alkali flat, or playa, that had played host to various recreational activities and cultural events for decades. The San Francisco-based Cacophony Society was instrumental to the first Nevada Burning Man event. Cacophony members dubbed the 1990 outing to Nevada, Zone Trip No. 4, Bad Day at Black Rock. The trip was officially announced in the organization's newsletter, Rough Draft, which outlined what to expect during the three-day excursion. On Labor Day weekend, roughly 80 people gathered at San Francisco's Golden Gate Park to join a caravan accompanying the 40-foot sculpture of the man in a rental truck as it embarked on the journey to Nevada. Upon arrival, longtime Cacophony Society member Michael Michael drew a line in the desert sand to demarcate the zone into which all would enter. He declared, on the other side of this line, everything will be different. With this act, 
Burning Man had officially relocated to Nevada. The first gathering in Nevada's Black Rock Desert in 1990 could be best described as a really great party among friends. Stuart Harvey, brother of Larry Harvey, is responsible for some of the most iconic photographs chronicling the origins and evolution of Burning Man. His images from that first year on the playa in 1990 tell the story of Burning Man's humble roots, but word got out about the annual gathering and attendance grew rapidly in the first five years. 600 people in 1992, 2,000 people in 1994, 4,000 people in 1995. With such rapid population growth, organizers recognized a growing need for order, increased communication, and improved safety. A survival guide was drafted, a safety group formed, a newspaper and radio station founded, and a schedule of activities released. Since the Black Rock Desert is located on federally managed public land under the jurisdiction of the U.S. Bureau of Land Management, a special recreational use permit was required. The first permit was issued in 1991 via fax with a note from the federal agent Jeff McCusker who authorized the event. Have fun, he wrote. From the beginning, art was integral to the cultural experience of Burning Man. 1992 marked the first time that artists were formally invited to participate. Their works serve as important precursors to what was to come in future decades. With Burning Man's cultural and social traditions firmly rooted, the behind-the-scenes business of Burning Man became formalized in the mid-1990s. In 1994, Larry Harvey, John Law, and Michael Michael drew up a partnership agreement, establishing the first legal entity of Burning Man. The following year, the trio registered the official Burning Man service mark with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Although the organizers of early Burning Man gatherings encouraged safety and an atmosphere of self-governance in the mid-1990s, a burgeoning Black Rock City with a population of 8,000 by 1996 verged on the brink of anarchy. The casual use of firearms, whether real or simulated, blended with high-speed driving, overindulgence, and the evolving but imperfect layout of an ever-growing encampment were a recipe for chaos. At the 1996 event, set against a fiery performance parody called Hell Co. that was based on the fictional story of Satan overtaking Burning Man, a constellation of events occurred to suggest that the gathering had reached a pivotal turning point. That year, artist and attendee Michael Fury died as his motorcycle clipped a moving vehicle while on the playa en route to the Burning Man camp. Three more attendees were seriously injured when their tents were hit in the middle of the night by a high-speed vehicle headed into the rave camp. The injuries and fatality of 1996 left many longtime attendees of the gathering shaken and stunned. John Law, who had been intimately involved in Burning Man, had fierce disagreements about the future of the gathering and left the organizing team. After 1996, he never returned to Burning Man again. At the same time, worldwide press and media coverage continued to fuel interest in the event. The media described Burning Man as the world's most dangerous festival, while at the same time, sci-fi novelist Bruce Sterling touted it as the new American holiday in his 1996 Wired magazine cover story. Following the events of that year, the Bureau of Land Management, the BLM, would not allow Burning Man to return to the Black Rock Desert. Black Rock City needed organization and infrastructure to ensure the safety and well-being of its temporary citizenry. To satisfy the need for improved infrastructure, safety, public health, and sustainability, Rod Garrett stepped in to configure Black Rock City's first civic design. Working in collaboration with others, Garrett proposed a semi-circular grid with vehicle access, allowing for organized navigation. His new design would be implemented on the Black Rock Desert in 1998. Even as early as 1995, Harley K. Dubois had recognized the need to fill in this city design to encourage interaction, community, and participation among Black Rock City's citizens. This entailed activating the city through the thoughtful placement of theme camps and other civic services. 
As the city manager of Black Rock City for over 10 years, Dubois and a planning team began to architect interactive culture by filling in the new semicircular layout to activate and sculpt the city into an accessible and livable social experiment. Dubois' oversight of the Playa Safety Council and Community Services Departments and her longtime commitment to volunteerism assured that the city ran smoothly. From 1998 forward, the planning team continued to improve the city design each year to satisfy the growing needs and increasing population of Black Rock City. One of these critical needs was for civic infrastructure. Will Roger Peterson founded Black Rock City's Department of Public Works, or DPW, in 1997. As in any major city, the Department of Public Works is responsible for civic infrastructure. In Black Rock City, this involves planning, surveying, building, and de-installing the city, as well as building the man each year. Peterson drafted the DPW's first field manual outlining the responsibilities of the department. Among the many traditions carried out by the DPW, the Golden Spike Ceremony is an annual ritual conducted by members of its crew. About a month before most people step foot on the desert, a small group gathers to strike the center point of the city so that the surveying of its layout can begin. The same sledgehammer has been used since 1998 to hammer the Golden Spike. This ritual begins the annual transformation of the Black Rock Desert into Black Rock City. Organizers also recognize the need to mediate public safety and provide information to the citizens of Black Rock City. Founded by Michael Michael, a.k.a. Danger Ranger, in 1992, the Black Rock Rangers are modeled after the Texas Rangers. The Rangers promote awareness of potential hazards, from sunstroke and tent fires to extreme weather conditions. The key to the organization's success is that the Rangers are not the other guys. They are participant volunteers who work throughout the city and its perimeters to ensure the collective survival of the community. They respond to the ever-changing environment and address situations that would otherwise require outside intervention. The civic design and circular layout of Black Rock City encourages networks of communication and interaction among its citizens, while also making space for communal gathering places and traditional ritual sites. Central to Black Rock City's cultural identity are the shared values known as the Ten Principles. While they resemble civic laws in some ways, they were not intended as rules of conduct. Rather, they reflect the core values that have organically evolved since the earliest days of the event. The wooden effigy, referred to fondly as the man, is recognized around the world as the icon of Burning Man. Placed in the center of Black Rock City, the man sculpture is a civic touchstone, elevated and visible from every corner of the community. Since 1986, people have come together to partake in the creation of the man, as well as the communal ritual of burning it, and yet it is not easy to pinpoint the man's symbolic meaning. According to the Burning Man organization, the figure represents nothing expressed or explicable, yet it is a physical and ethical guidepost during at least one week of the year. The fire rituals and performances associated with Burning the Man have grown more elaborate over the years. The Fire Conclave is a composition of fire performance groups from around the world who create choreography dedicated to honoring the man. Crimson Rose has long been involved in fire arts, fire safety, and pyrotechnics in Black Rock City and is integral to the collaborative rituals of the Fire Conclave. In 1991, Crimson climbed the man while wearing 16-foot silk serpentine wings. Since then, she has felt it is her responsibility to make sure the man is released and burned in the best way possible. For 20 years, Crimson has returned to the site of the man following the burn to collect whatever remnants and relics remain. Twisted metal, melted neon, bent nails and ashes sift through her hands and find their way into her glass collection jars. The jars can be likened to reliquaries that hold the sacred remains of the Burning Man community's most venerated figure. If the man is the iconic center of Black Rock City, the temple is the city's most sacred gathering place. The temple is where citizens come together in quiet contemplation to reflect, grieve, and rest in a process of transformation. 
a respectful silence often pervades the atmosphere in and around the temple as visitors embrace, shed tears, and leave handwritten notes or other mementos in memory of lost loved ones. At the end of the Burning Man event, the temple is burned. Since 2000, California-based artist David Best has designed and overseen the creation of nine of the 17 Burning Man temples sited in Black Rock City. His first temple in 2000 was built as a tribute to his friend, who died tragically in an accident shortly before the event. A dynamic group of volunteers come together each year and dedicate their time to the construction of the temple. The fabrication and realization of the temples are a vital collaborative ritual that has brought together thousands of people over the past two decades. Time and again, it has been said that a city's commitment to arts and culture is a sound indicator of its civic and community health. Each year, Larry Harvey scripts and produces the Burning Man event's annual art theme, which informs much of the large-scale art produced for the playa. For nearly 20 years, Burning Man's art department has offered financial and logistical support for the creation and transportation of artworks to Burning Man. As of 2017, the budget for competitive honoraria approached $1.3 million annually. Starting in 2001, the Burning Man organization has also worked to bring interactive, civic-minded artwork to the world outside of Black Rock City through the establishment of the Black Rock Arts Foundation. The Global Arts Grants Program has supported 164 projects in 34 states and 24 countries to date. Today, Burning Man Arts carries out this vision by supporting the creation of impactful, interactive artwork in Black Rock City and beyond. 70,000 people now come together as citizens of Black Rock City in Nevada annually, and thousands more cannot obtain the coveted tickets needed to gain entrance. The population of Black Rock City has outgrown the civic boundaries of its ancestral desert home. As of 2017, Burning Man has over 80 affiliated events worldwide. In communities around the world, local volunteers referred to as regional contacts help expand Burning Man's 10 principles and culture through year-round events and activities. Marion Goodell has steered the development of the Burning Man Regional Network, which now has more than 280 representatives in 35 countries across six continents. Leaders of these groups come together under the umbrella of the Burning Man organization to ensure that the cultural values of Burning Man are interpreted and applied appropriately at events far from the playa. Another example of how Burning Man is spreading its cultural values around the globe is the grassroots, volunteer-driven community leadership organization known as Burners Without Borders. Burners Without Borders was founded in 2005 when several Burning Man participants headed to the south coast of the United States to assist with disaster relief efforts following Hurricane Katrina. Their initial focus was on rebuilding the Buddhist temple in Biloxi, Mississippi. The first volunteers on site were members of the Burning Man Temple crew. Their support of the Biloxi Vietnamese community and its temple inspired their designation as the Temple to Temple crew. Since 2005, Burners Without Borders has supported volunteer efforts at disaster sites around the world. Since 1999, the Burning Man event and all of its affiliated programs have been managed through a limited liability corporation known as Black Rock City LLC 1999. That legal entity was established by six individuals who are referred to as the modern-day co-founders. Harley K. Dubois, Marion Goodell, Larry Harvey, Michael Michael, Will Roger Peterson, and Crimson Rose have steered the growth and maturation of the organization over the past 18 years. In 2008, through collective self-reflection, the co-founders recognized the need to change the organization's structure to keep the culture alive beyond their lifetimes. It was then that they began discussing the possibility of transitioning to a non-profit organization. After three years of transition, the Burning Man Project received its official non-profit status in 2013. Today, the Burning Man Project is overseen by a board of directors who named Marion Goodell as its first CEO. 
Through speaking engagements and cultural outreach both in the U.S. and overseas, she now leads the nonprofit's efforts to extend Burning Man culture around the world. The establishment of Burning Man Project also paved the way for the growth of the organization's next chapter. In 2016, through philanthropic gifts from the Burning Man community, Burning Man Project purchased a 3,800-acre property known as Fly Ranch, located 21 miles north of Gerlach in Washoe County, Nevada. While discussions are still underway regarding the future of Fly Ranch, the Burning Man Project hopes it will become a place with the potential to amplify Burning Man's cultural impact beyond Black Rock City. It is yet but another step forward in the evolution of the global cultural movement we have come to know as Burning Man. <laughs>